Welcome to Viewpoints. I'm Heather Isveron, and with me today is Mike German, Policy Counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union and author of Thinking Like a Terrorist, released in 2007. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. So tell me what it's like as an ex-FBI agent going all the way over to the ACLU. Uh, well, it makes me a little bit different from most ACLU lawyers, um, but you know, I, I feel very fortunate that, uh, that when I left the FBI, uh, I was able to find a job where I could put my uh, efforts towards something that I believed in as far as uh, you know, protecting not just uh, the, the constitutional rights that we all have, but also uh, what I think is improving our security, which is, uh, I, I believe, uh, you know, one of the most effective ways we can protect our security is by preserving the rule of law and preserving our system of government. And that's been very effective for years, and I found it was very effective as an FBI agent. Great, and I want to ask you a little bit more about that later. Sure. But first, uh, the premise of your book is about uh, how basically we misunderstand what the terrorists want and how they intend to get it. Can you explain that a bit? Sure. Uh, I have a, a bit of an unusual uh, uh, education in terrorism in that uh, I actually joined terrorist groups as an FBI undercover agent. And uh, what I found was that, that sort of the common understanding of what terrorist groups are and how they operate is very misunderstood, and particularly in government, in the FBI, and the intelligence community, and that those misunderstandings uh, contribute to the creation of policy that is actually very counterproductive if you're trying to prevent terrorism. Um, so, uh, you know, what I found was that uh, sort of the the fuel for for the terrorism engine is a sense of injustice. And where, wherever the government can show that its, its authority is being used in a legitimate manner, that actually tamps down terrorism rather than expands it. And whenever the government acts outside the rule of law, that actually gives justification and fuel for the terrorists. And so um, somebody from our audience, some Homeland Security official, law enforcement, fire official, what, in what ways might they better understand what a terrorist wants and how they're going to get it? Uh, well, I think the f initial thing to understand is, is terrorism is still very rare, thankfully, and, and the number of terrorists is still very small. And what the terrorists want to do is create confusion in our security apparatus to where our security officials uh, basically paint with a broad brush. And instead of focusing on the few individuals who are engaged in illegal behavior, focus on, in on entire groups of people, profile, uh, uh, you know, entire communities and mistreat them or treat them in a manner that, that makes clear to them that they are being viewed as a suspicious uh, uh, part of the community and alienate them. And that's really the goal of the terrorist. The reason that the terrorist writes out a manifesto where they identify the community they're claiming to represent is so that the government will know who to, uh, to respond against. And, and the purpose is to create a divide between the government and that community. I mean, we've got to Remember that terrorism is, is a tool of the weak, you know, the politically weak. They don't have the ability to get their message across through legitimate means. They don't have the military, military might to actually accomplish a military victory. So what they use is, is basically a trick by doing something harmful uh, and, and, you know, as awful as they can make it, they're hoping for an overreaction by government so that the government will create that alienation of the community. So it's very important as you're out there working in these areas that you make very clear, uh, you know, why, why you are focusing on particular individuals and, you know, what I found in my work that it, if you focused on people that you had some reasonable cause to rather than through profiling or other types of inappropriate law enforcement, uh, you'll be much more successful. So treating it with a broad brush is largely ineffective rather than the relationship. Right, and, and actually counterproductive. I mean, you know, I mean, one of the ways I've tried to explain it is every moment investigating or collecting information about an innocent person is a wasted security dollar that, that should have been gone, should have been used to actually look at people who there is some reason to suspect that they're doing something wrong. And, you know, there are plenty of bad people in our community who, who want to do harm, uh, as I used to train uh, young FBI agents, you know, if you can't articulate why you think focusing your time and attention on this person will likely result in a prosecution, there are probably other people you should be focusing on. And particularly where terrorists have identified a, a class of people that they don't actually represent, 
you know, anything that, that tended to uh, make that terrorist propaganda true by driving a wedge between that community and the government is going to help the terrorists su successfully reach their goals. And so is that true of not just the kind of the neo-Nazi and the homegrown terrorists, but also the religious uh, oriented types? Sure. Uh, you know, and, and one thing, again, people don't understand about these different groups, the white supremacist terrorists, may, many of them are actually uh, led by religious ideologies that, that justify their belief that the races should be separate. Um, so there are a lot of overlaps. But more importantly, uh, what I found uh, from my investigations and my later academic study of the issue, if you look at the different groups, the methodology they use is all the same, the terrorists, not necessarily the ideological part of the movement. And, you know, I think uh, particularly people working in the field have to understand there's a difference between those people who are a actually out there going and committing crime and the people who are espousing uh, beliefs that we might find abhorrent. And they're, they're separate communities. Uh, so if you study the community that is actually engaged in violence, uh, the, the methodology they use is the same across the different ideologies, whether you're talking about you know, terrorists in Algeria in the 1950s and 60s, to terrorists in uh, uh, London and uh, Ireland in the 1970s and 80s and on until today, uh, or extremists here in the United States or anywhere, that the methodologies they use are very similar. And if you, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, is you don't have to take my word for it. They actually publish a lot of material. Mm -hmm. uh, part, part of the reason is, as a clandestine organization, they don't know one another literally don't know one another. So the only way they, they can get sort of the direction and, and their uh, strategy across is by publishing it so that others can find it. And, uh, and if you read those materials, which is a lot of mo what my book is just going through their materials and explaining how they're trying to accomplish a particular goal and that the use of violence is not um, out of a, a, a bloodthirstiness uh, or out of you know some psychological uh, problem, but rather is, is strategic, and they're trying to accomplish certain goals, and it's really trying to uh, create a real grievance in the community that they're representing. So for, for me, just to understand it, it's more about human nature, probably, than about religion or anything like that, more about power and, and struggling to belong and those kinds of things. Rather sure. Than I, I found it interesting after 9-11 that they started talking about this fourth generational warfare, where really terrorism is first generational warfare. I mean, one of the things that I talk about in, in my book is, you know, we talk about terrorists as thugs and assassins. Well, of course, the thugs and assassins really existed in ancient times yeah. and actually used these same asymmetric techniques in order to, you know, fight a war against a much more powerful government. Uh, so these are, are ancient techniques, and uh, human nature plays a huge role in, in it. And, and we have to understand what it is they're trying to accomplish to effectively counter what they're doing. And if any of our r responses to their violence actually create more terrorists or justify the use of violence, uh, we're actually working against ourselves. And so in that, in, in your field and in your um, work with ACLU, the intelligence gathering, the, mm -hmm. the issues that surround that, uh, can you give me some examples of where that works best or where we're missing the boat? Um, well, I, you know, I think if, if you look at the 9-11 Commission report or the Joint House-Senate Intelligence Commission investigation, or really any of the Inspector General reports uh, that have come out criticizing FBI policies. Uh, you know, there have been management reports of the CIA. There have been studies of CIA failures with Iraq weapons of mass destruction. If you look at all those, they all have sort of have the same underpinnings, that it's not, it's not a lack, lack of authority of these agencies. You know, typically what they find, like 9-11, was that these agencies had gathered significant amounts of information that could have been used. It's, it's the mismanagement of those resources. And, you know, unfortunately, where they're able to operate in such secrecy, they're never held accountable. And that lack of accountability is what allows problems to continue to exist. And so what I've been trying to convince Congress is that they have to be much more aggressive in oversight of these agencies, and that will make them more effective, that if they know they have to prove their worth and, and put uh, you know, their, their methods to the test of public, public scrutiny, they'll be much more careful and, and 
much more effective in the end. And so um, with that, what is your view on terrorism in the United States today? Are they here? Where are they? What are they doing? Should we be worried? You know, I, I would be the last person to tell you that there aren't bad people in the community. I mean, I worked as a uh, FBI agent for 16 years, and there are plenty of criminal threats. But I think we have to understand, number one, understand what the nature of this threat is to understand how we can most effectively counter it, but also understand that there are a lot of threats to our security. You know, I found it uh, very interesting that in the uh, Director of National Intelligence's threat summary for the year, uh, early in the year, they said the, uh, the global economic meltdown was the number one national security threat to the United States. Well, in 2004, FBI agents in the FBI's white collar crime program asked for more resources because they saw an uptick in mortgage frauds mm -hmm. and were denied those resources because the message was, no, 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 we're looking at national security threats. You know, so I think, I think that's the sort of oversight and comprehensive view that we have to take to this. That yes, terrorism is a threat, it will always be a threat to the United States and, and to all of our communities, and that threat is not just from abroad, there are people right here who, who engage in terrorism. Um, you know, and I think it's a mistake if we forget that. But at the same time, uh, there are a lot of other criminal threats, and we have to treat it as a criminal threat, one of many, and use effective techniques and hold the agencies that are responsible uh, to account for how they're addressing their problems. So that brings me more to the policy side of the, of the conversation. The terrorist trials that are coming up in New York City, what, what is your uh, perspective or the ACLU's perspective on these terrorists that may come to New York City? Should they be treated as American citizens or as internationals? Um, the ACLU supports uh, bringing these detainees to trial. We've been supporting that for quite a while and, uh, and are happy that, that um, at least some of the detainees will, will be seeing uh, trial in the United States. Um, you know, and particularly from my experience uh, working, pro <laughs> prosecuting terrorists, um, you know, that's really the strength of our system is to expose the illegal conduct, to show the evidence, and, and to reestablish the rule of law is, is critically important. And it's something terrorists fear. You know, the one thing that terrorists want to be treated as is warriors, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so treating them as criminals actually undermines their ability to have any success in their own community and is something that I think is part of a, a much more effective counterterrorism strategy. And, you know, not only that, that if you use a transparent system that does protect the rights of all people, uh, that system will be much more legitimate in, uh, in the eyes of the international community and it will be much more difficult for terrorists to, to claim they're the victims of an injustice. And, and so there are many <laughs> reasons why I think criminal trials are the way to go. Okay, so, and just to take a double advocate view, the military tribunals, if they were transparent, would they also be a viable alternative? Um, you know, the, the only way it could be viable is if you zealously guarded the rights of the defendants the same way you would in a criminal justice system. And we already have that system. So there's no need to create another one. You know, there have been hundreds of terrorists convicted in the United States criminal courts around the country, and, and there really is no impediment to doing that. And, you know, in some cases what people say is, well, there isn't the evidence to convict them. Well, you know, that may be a clue that perhaps this person isn't guilty. You know, if the only evidence that you have is tainted either by torture or uh, any other method, that would taint the quality of that evidence as definitive that this person was engaged in misconduct. So, you know, I think the truth is very important and I think that the system that we have is the most effective at getting to the truth and abandoning it I think was a huge mistake in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but the quicker that we, we reestablish that system and reinforce it, I think the quicker we'll be back to a more normalized posture. So uh, since 9-11, it's, it's been eight years now, do you think that our system has improved or do you think we're now, with maybe this case, learning from our mistakes? Um, well, I hope we're learning from our mistakes. Um, you know, there's, there's still far too much secrecy in, in uh, the uh, uh, intelligence community. You know, I, I mean, on September 10, 2001, we didn't realize how dysfunctional the intelligence community had become but we actually know less about the internal operations of the intelligence community now than we did in 2001, and that's a huge problem. Uh, so, 
you know, I think it is incumbent upon Congress to, you know, hold these agencies to account and to make them justify uh, their conduct. And when there's, where there's abuse, you know, the best way to deal with it is to get it out on the table, to examine who is responsible, to hold those responsible to account and, and you know, move on from there. But continuing to pretend it didn't happen or to hide the evidence, I think, is, is, is only going to prolong the, the damage that was done. Wow, fascinating. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.